now I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, this month's uh, guest, Emma Butt. And I'll tell you a bit about Emma before we start asking her loads of questions. Um, Emma is a freelance dubbing mixer, sound editor, designer, and ADR recordist. She has over 10 years of experience in post-production sound in a variety of projects, from mixing documentaries and entertainment short shows, short form commercials, short films and animations, to ADR recordings for drama and feature films and sound editing with an experience in a wide variety of projects. She started her career in screen scene post-production in Ireland, where she spent nine years, and she's worked on loads of shows, which I know you're going to know, because that includes Game of Thrones, Vikings, and Reaper Street, among others. <coughs> She was nominated for a NIFTA award twice, and she also received a Certificate of Merit for the Emmys for her ADR work on Series 5 of Game of Thrones. Um, and I expect you to make some dragon sounds in the process as well <laughs> of the talk. Yeah, no. Sorry, I didn't tell you that. <laughs> in the UK, she has worked at some well-known London post-production houses before she decided to step into the freelancing work. Um, she's council member of the Association of Motion Picture Sound Engineers and a mentor with the Media Trust on both her schemes to help young kids get work in the creative industries. And she's very, very recently been working on ADR for the latest series of Doctor Who. So loads of very, very impressive things uh, and we're delighted to have you. So thank you so much for coming today. Thanks um, So what we'll do is we'll have a bit of a chat with Emma and there will be at the end of the session some time for you to ask questions. So if you have any questions, make a note of them. Uh, so that you can ask them afterwards. So the first thing I, I kind of was curious about is how you how did you enter the field of sound and, and the field of post production specifically? Well, post was not my first option. Okay. Um, live sound was actually where I wanted to go. Um, so when I was in school, I used to sing in choirs and always wanted to be a singer. Knew I was never going to be good enough. So our school choir actually went and decided to record an album for charity. And this guy came along with his little mixing desk and his microphones. And I was just like, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and I was about 15 at the time. So I started researching colleges in Dublin or universities over here. So we call it something different. Um, so I started researching colleges and I found Pulse Recording Studios. So at the time, it was a private college. So you had to pay to go. It didn't matter what you got in school yeah. for your grades. Um, so I went... And the course covered just sound, plus sound for everything. So it was radio, live sound, music, and post-production. Okay. And hated music recording. <laughs> did not enjoy it. <laughs> Bands were a pain in my arse, because they just <laughs> did not listen to anything you said. Um, and I loved live sound, and I loved post-production. So we had to like recreate the uh, sound to Tom and Jerry. Um, okay. And that was one of my favourite <laughs> things to do. And we had to do a radio play, so we did... Um, I think it was War of the Worlds. We had to re we recreated War of the Worlds, and it was coming up to the end of my uh, uni year, and I was going to have to go out and get a job. So I started applying to all the different facilities uh, within Dublin, and at the time, Screen Scene Post Production were looking for runners. So okay. I applied, went for the interview, and they said to me, "You know, we'll give you a call on the Wednesday, let you know." Okay. <laughs> Didn't hear anything back, so I called them back up. Okay. And turns out they had applied, or they had actually offered the job to someone else because they thought I was going to be too soft to handle it as a runner. And <laughs> I don't I, even want to ask what that means. <laughs> I don't even know to this day. Um, but lucky for me, the girl that they hired uh, decided on her lunch break, she didn't want to be there. Uh, she hated it. And um, she went on her lunch it was break. a very bad lunch break. <laughs> yeah. But she never came back. So she went on her lunch break and never showed back up for work. God. Yeah. So um, I called at just the right time because this had just happened. And uh, the facilities manager said, well, can you start on Monday? So I went in, uh, finished the uni part time, started working in screen scene and loved it. Absolutely loved it. Did you um, like the lunch breaks as well? Yes, I did. <laughs> and I always came back. And it was a joke for my first week. Every time I arrived back into work, they were always really shocked. <laughs> so, you know, it worked out well. Yes. Um, so, yeah. And I just spent nine years there. And I loved it. I started off as a runner. Um, after about five months of being a runner, I was really, really lucky. I got promoted to um, bookings, audio bookings. Okay. Um, and dim reception as well. And the whole point of that was they wanted to move me into audio to be an audio assistant, but okay. they wanted the clients to get to know me and get to feel right. comfortable around me. So I did reception for, I think, about five months as well. 
it was meant to be a year yeah. and we just got really busy so they moved me in sooner oh, okay. and I started off in short form hated it didn't enjoy it at all don't like advertising it's not for me um <laughs> and pestered my managing director to let me go into long form Okay. And enough pestering apparently worked. That's a good tip. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, pester. Have you complained enough? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, went into long form and absolutely loved it. That's great. And just, yeah, I've been there ever since. Yeah. And that's quite, it's speedy moving forward, isn't it? Yeah. Because only after, we said, 10 months, you were already in a position that you were quite happy with. Yeah. I, I mean, I know that I'm a rarity that that happens because I've met so many people who've had to be a runner for like, year two years and then they eventually start to progress but I think from what I've gathered from my MD was the fact that I mean I was staying late every night after work yeah I was going in on my lunch break sitting in with the guys I was asking them for projects that I could okay. do out of hours right. and yeah. I was putting the work in yeah and it just kind of showed to them that I was hungry for it I really wanted it yeah so yeah, it just kind of progressed from there. So it seems to me that you you weren't lucky. <laughs> you worked hard to to, yeah. to get the position. So uh. I was lucky with the timing of the runner okay. thing. Yeah. <laughs> but no, with everything else, I mean, I worked my backside off and I was yeah. exhausted. Yeah. But I knew that I had to. I okay. mean, the competition yeah. is so tough. Yeah. And there were so many other runners who wanted to get into sound. And if I didn't, I mean, I was just going to leave myself behind in the queue yeah. to try and progress. And actually, I was the very last person they uh, promoted into audio. Okay. Um, I think until I left the company. Okay, all right. So no one actually came in after me, so I timed it really well, and I, I'm glad that I put that hard work yeah. in. Okay. Um, yeah, that's and, it. and what was, your, what was your, your first big project, the one that you felt, okay, I'm established now, I feel like I've made it, and I'm, 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 in, I'm in an established position. What was that project? It was definitely um, what Richard did with Lenny Abramson. Okay. So Lenny is, for anybody who doesn't know him, he directed Room, uh, which was nominated for quite a few Oscars. He's just released Little Stranger, um, mm -hmm. which I think just came out on the 21st. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And Lenny, he started his career as a commercials director, and he was always in screen scene. And one of his first movies was called Adam and Paul. Okay. And it's a cult classic in Ireland. It's <laughs> a brilliant movie. It's really raw, really gritty. And ever since I watched that, I was like, this is a director I want to work with. And I need to work with him someday. And what Richard did was not only the first feature film that I got to do all of the ADR for the whole thing, it was also one of his movies. Okay. And it was such a weird experience having this director that I've admired for so long, actually valuing my opinion and asking me what I thought, if the ADR was going to fit, if it was going to work. Okay. And that's kind of when I knew yeah, this is, well, I've done it, I'm doing really well. That's good. It seems like it was a very positive experience about what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, Lenny is just incredible. He's, he's the only person who told me not to move to the UK when I was deciding <laughs> what I wanted to do. Because he's very, like, staunchly Irish and supports Irish Q, uh, crews. Okay. But he's really supportive. He's one of the few directors I know that even now at the level that he's reached, you can still, like anybody, any runner that he comes across or anybody in a low position, they can go to him and say, oh, could you give me some advice? You know, I'm thinking about doing this with my career. I know for a fact he will say yes. And he will take time out of his day to go That's and meet nice. them for a coffee and just, you know, sit down and have a chat with them. And it's amazing. Lovely. Yeah. That's good. So, so rare sometimes to find people that are willing to give their time up yeah. to, to just give advice and support. That's great. And of course, you're, uh, this, this kind of leads us nicely to, to the fact that one of your areas of expertise is as an ADR recordist, um, and you've, of course, worked with in, in, in shows such as Game of Thrones. And I was wondering if you could talk us through both the creative and technical process of ADR recording. I mean, there's also a third aspect to ADR that people okay. don't realise, and it's, uh, it comes down to personality. A huge part of ADR is actually how you work the room how you can control... Okay, so nine times out of ten, a director and an actor have had a huge falling out uh, <laughs> after a production, and they hate each other, and they don't want to see each other again, but they have to, because they have to come in for ADR. <laughs> um, and you're in a really, really tough situation where you have a director who doesn't want to see the actor, an actor who doesn't want to see the director, and they both need to communicate. You need to get your lines, and the actor actually is the most important person in the room, because yeah. they need to be relaxed. They need to be calm because ADR 
ADR will always look bad if you get a terrible performance. Mm. So anytime you see bad ADR, it's not because of the way, most of the time it's not because of the way it's been recorded or the room it's been done in or the mics that have been used. It's down to performance. Yep. So if the actor doesn't give the same pitch, tone and performance oh. as on set, you're fecked. It's never going to fit. You're just, it's going to stand out like a sore thumb. Sorry, I say fecked a lot. Um, we'll put a beep in the recording. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so that's one of the hardest parts, actually. It's not yeah. the creative process or the technical. It's how you can get those really difficult personalities to calm down and just work together. for. Because sometimes you're doing ADR for, you know, if it's a feature film, you could be doing it for two days, depending on how many cues the actor has. And if they hate each other and they have to be locked in a room for two days straight for nine hour days, <laughs> it is really horrible. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so that is a really big part of it. Um, oh, nice. Technical wise, you have to be quick. Okay. Like You have to be really speedy. I think there's two facilities in London that I know of that use the two man, two person system. I'm trying to stop myself from saying two man. Um, and that's Goldcrest and Lip Sync and what usually happens in that process is you have an assistant on one side who looks after the Pro Tools okay. and then the ADR mixer who okay. actually mixes so they'll adjust the reverb, EQ, uh, look after the mics and they'll look after the playback now I disagree with this system I think if okay. you're good enough you can do it by yourself you don't need an assistant okay. um, but if you do you have to be quick because okay. You need to control the mics, monitor that your clip and boom are sounding exactly as you need it to. Okay. Yeah. Um, then you, once the take is recorded, you've got to quickly edit it up, okay. fit it, sync it up, then play it back, but play it back where it's EQ'd. Uh, your reverb is going to match the lines that are incoming and outgoing. Yeah. Your EQ is also going to match, and you've got fill that you can fill in from where you've taken okay. out the original yeah. line. And play back play it back to the client and kind of sell it to them and make okay. them believe that it's going to fit. Yeah. And you don't get long to do that. No. <laughs> you, I'd say, if, I never even say actually five minutes. I'd say you have about one or two minutes. Okay, all right. By the time the actor has finished recording and by the time you have to play it back. And if you're any longer, the client gets frustrated. They're just going to say, well, what the hell are you doing? And they're okay. going to ask for a different record this next time. Okay. So that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really pressurized. I mean, when I come out of the studio, if I've done ADR for a whole day, I can't speak to anybody for about an hour afterwards because <laughs> I've had so many people shouting instructions at me. Because okay. another part of the problem is if you're in, so you can do ADR two ways. You can mm -hmm. do it with a open plan studio. So we could be in a room like this, or you can do it in a room where you have a control room and booth. Yeah, okay. If you're doing it in an open plan studio like this, you might have maybe three or four different monitor mixes you also have okay. to control. Okay. So not only do you have your own uh, monitor mix, you have the actor, uh, you have the director, and then you also have the dialogue supervisor. Okay. Um, I have a dialogue supervisor that I work with quite a bit whose his eyesight isn't amazing. Okay. So how he um, checks if the sync is going to work on an ADR line is he has to listen to it back with the guide track okay, yeah. and see if it phases. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of directors don't want to hear the guide track being played back. Okay. <laughs> they want to hear just the ADR. Yeah. I like to hear it with the guide as well. Yeah. Actor, it's 50-50 sometimes. Yeah. So then you've got four different monitor mixes you also need to do. And then as soon as they're fixed, you then need to go back and play back your take that you've just done. And again, put all the reverb and EQ on it. All right. So it's, yeah thing that I've kind of learned is speed. I know my shortcuts. I know okay. my shortcuts really well. <laughs> I know my template really well. Okay. So if I go into a facility when I'm freelancing, I don't use their template. Okay. If I can, I'll use my own because I know where okay. everything is. I know where I can find it. And I know that I'm not going to have to faff about for five minutes trying to find a track. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the most important things. You need to be comfortable with your own workflow. So no matter where you go, no matter what studio you're in, you know that if you only have five minutes to set up, it's fine. Yeah. You can wing it. It will be absolutely grand. Yeah. And creative, creative, ADR is one of those that doesn't really end up being creative, <laughs> which is frustrating. I mean, the most creative thing I did actually is um, in what Richard did, which I think we're going to yeah. show a clip of, and the scene that actually we're going to show, 
Um, it's a group of teenagers outside and we needed to record crowd ADR. So for anybody who doesn't know what crowd ADR is, uh, if you have a scene in a movie where there's a large crowd in the background, it's sometimes recorded on location, but not all the time. So what they'll do is they'll get a group of actors to come into a studio and we'll record them in time to the picture. Yep. Um, and with this particular scene, we wanted to make it sound really realistic. Okay. <laughs> so back in Dublin, in the studio that we had, um, the ADR room was right beside the back door to the building. And outside of that was the car park. So for this scene, we actually took the mics, uh, brought them out into the car park, <laughs> and kind of tried to recreate the location sound, and got the actors, the crowd actors, to go into the car park, and scream and shout and do okay. whatever they needed to uh, to recreate the scene. Okay. And then we got given out to by the neighbours because uh, we live, we were working in a residential area and we were waking up all their kids at seven o'clock at night. <laughs> so uh, we got in a bit of trouble. Well, seven o'clock is quite early, isn't it? I know, but apparently <laughs> young kids need to sleep early is what we got seven told. Seven. So, <laughs> um, And that's about the most creative thing you get to do. Which, okay. Well, there's one other creative thing, but you don't get to do it too often, and it's airline versions. So okay. <laughs> every movie that you see, um, you have to change the curse words or any words that even relate to religion. So God, okay, yeah. yeah, you can't use it. And it has to be changed into okay. an airline version. Right, okay. So half the time, the director doesn't care. Producers don't care. <laughs> they just want it replaced. So you get to create words. <laughs> and you basically get to come up with a word that will kind of relate to the scene. <laughs> But we'll also work with the mouth movement. And really, you don't really care about the seat. You just care about the mouth. So okay. you can come up with some <laughs> mental stuff. I can't even think of some of the I things I was going to say, can up. you give yeah, us an example? No. I want to know now. I think, well, I'm going to have to curse if I say anything. Um, <laughs> Anybody will be terribly offended, I don't think. <laughs> well, after you see the clip, you're, if you it's do right, find it offensive, fine. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, oh, my God, I can't think of anything. I think fuck sometimes gets changed into... I think duck. I was going to say, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think we do change us it. with all the ducks we have at York. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you do, you get, that's the only time you get to be really creative is with airline versions because you can just do anything. They just give you free reign. So you just don't care. It's like, as long as it's covered, this is the most ridiculous thing in the world. But then they get a nice surprise and they're on the airplane, <laughs> see their movie, and they, we've so, just come up with the most random the words. <laughs> So it works out really well. Um, so yeah, so that's probably the most creative thing we get to do. Wait, sounds like fun. It is. It, it usually is the best part of the process. So there's a, there's a couple of things I wanted to follow up. So so we talked about having a template that for you is very important because it's your own and you go in and, and you're ready. So tell us a bit about what, what would we find in this template? So definitely stereo tracks. So okay. unlike VO, you don't record mono tracks. Okay. You record stereo, you keep your boom on your left and your clip on the right. Okay. Um, some people do three track recordings, I don't, I think it's overkill. Um, okay. You're replicating what was on set, so boom and clip is absolutely fine. Okay, yeah. um, you'll always find your selected takes at the top, um, all, all alternative takes at the bottom. Um, I'll always have my guide track, guide track is always split, dialogue left, music and effects right. Okay. Um, so they'll be on two separate mono tracks and then I'll create a fill track. Okay. My fill track I usually create by going through with um, Orex Ambience Match. It's just been the most incredible lifesaver. It's yeah. quite new, isn't it? Yeah. It is incredible. So before uh, Orex Ambience Match, you used to have to go through, find every line that was going to be used in, or we were going to do in that scene, and try and find the tiniest amount of dead air that you could okay. just create a loop. And it was so time-consuming. So... Or ex ambience match means I don't have to waste about two hours doing this before oh, a session. Okay. I can just go find the scene, ambience match it, create my fill track, mm -hmm. and I've got it done in like two seconds. It's incredible. It's an amazing tool. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll have my fill track and then I'll have reverbs. I'll always have a big, medium, and large, or big, small, and ambient. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'll try and set my presets on my reverbs to what I think the reverb was in that scene. Okay, all right. So you'll listen through. Um, I'll always try and get the full picture of a project that I'm about to do, okay. possibly the day before. I always try and say 48 hours because I need that prep time. Yeah. With the way schedules <laughs> are going, it never usually works out that way. Um, 
but I'll always try and watch through the whole uh, film or the whole episode. Okay, yeah. And then try and figure out what the reverb is going to be like for that scene. Um, and then try and use it in my presets. And then try and get my EQs roughly presetted as well so that I can just load them up really quickly. Because again, okay, yeah. it comes down to speed. I need to be quick. Okay, so you have all your presets ready there to, to go. That you just click. And to be honest, most presets usually work for like multiple different shows. Okay. <laughs> it's not that you constantly have to change them. If, you, if it's just rough, that it's rough enough that a client isn't really going to know it's not perfect, okay. but it's going to replicate the scene enough, you totally get away with it. Okay. It's just there to sell it. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I, I guess that you can always tweak it afterwards if, if exactly. you need it. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. And, and the other thing was about this, uh, so, so you talked about a setup uh, that is kind of a control room and a live room and then another mm -hmm. one that is an open plan. Mm -hmm. So what would be the advantages of having that open plan setting? Well, one of the biggest problems with ADR is that the actors generally struggle to get back into the headspace of yep. that character. So ADR is generally done months after they've finished on location. They've, you know, they've shot their movie, shot their episodes, whatever yeah. it was they're doing. Uh, they've gone on, they've done other projects, they've done different characters, they've done <laughs> different accents, which is always a big issue. <laughs> um, and then they have to come back to this project that they did months ago that they might not even remember that well. Okay. They might have to do an emotional scene, and that emotional scene, they're going to have to get back into that headspace of it. Okay, yeah. And if you put them into a booth where it's completely isolated and no one around, you're making an already strained and unrealistic situation even more unrealistic. Yeah. Whereas if you're in an open plan room where, you know, they can see the director, they can see the producer, they can see me, okay. they can interact with people. OK, it's not the same as being on set, but it kind of helps them get back into that mind frame. Okay. And it just makes them feel a bit more relaxed and a bit more comfortable. The only downside to the open plan is producers are pain in the arses and don't get off their bloody laptops. <laughs> so you're trying to record and they're there, yeah. And you're just like... Email send. <laughs> and you'll... Oh, it always happens. You'll get a take and you'll be struggling to get a line of ADR where the actor has gotten the pitch, performance, everything, and it's in sync and you're really happy and the director will be delighted and right in the middle of the bloody line, some producers decided to send an email, and all you can hear is the <laughs> click clacking. And you're like, you little feckers. <laughs> and you have to do it again, and you have to explain it to the actor about why we have to do it again. And oh. it's, yeah, it's the only downside. And do you have any, any tips on how to try to, to help the actors get that sync with the original? It depends on the actor. I mean, you can use queuing systems. Um, yeah. So that's another thing that's in my template is uh, I'll always have some way of queuing them. So you can either have beeps or wipes. Okay. Um, or some actors, if they're musically inclined, will actually do listen and repeat. So they won't okay. actually do it in time. What they'll do is you'll play them the line. Okay. And then you'll whip everything out of their cans and they'll automatically repeat their line. Okay. And they do it to try and get the rhythm. Yeah and get the tone and get the pitch and if an actor is really good at that skill as soon as you slip that into sync it's perfect yeah <laughs> it's amazing and i've met some actors that that's the only way they can work but as soon as i move that take into roughly where it should be it's bang on i can't fault it yeah <laughs> it's incredible so it's the key just to maybe adapt the system that you're using to who you're working yeah. with and, and in that way getting the best exactly the best it okay. comes down again to reading the room and reading your actor and seeing you know, how they want to approach things. Yeah. Like last week I had an actress who, um, she couldn't have anybody say anything to her after listening to production. So we were doing okay. a Source Connect session and okay. uh, yeah. the ADR supervisor was over in, I think, Canada. And I was in the UK with the actress. So we'd play her production so she could get used to the line. And then as soon as I'd stop playing production, the di <laughs> dialogue super, she was very lovely kept on having a conversation with the actress and I could see the actress getting really frustrated because okay, yeah. she couldn't remember then what the line was meant to sound like. Yeah. So I'd have to do the process again. So then I kept on muting um, the, <laughs> the Source Connect return so they couldn't hear. And actually it worked amazingly well because as soon as I did that, she had no distractions. She just went straight for it and her sync was perfect. Yeah. So you just have to read how your actress is feeling or her actor is yeah. feeling. It's quite interesting how, how a lot of this kind of 
a lot of in audio engineering we talk a lot about techniques but a lot of it comes to actually social and communication skills yeah. isn't it and, and then maybe the technique can be improved with time and, and adapted yeah. so it's, it's really interesting to, to hear you talk about how important that is that is to you is there anything that you can tell us about how you approach that particular scene? I mean, you talked a bit about the crowd scenes, which I imagine yeah. was the people fighting in the, in the back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the rest of it, actually, most of that scene is ADR. Um, like, the whole thing. All right. Um, every actor. I think we had problems with the location recording, so we had to redo, I think it's 90% of the dialogue in that okay. scene. That's quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, which hopefully I don't think you can see. Yeah. Um, and we were lucky in that some of the actors were more experienced, so trying to get them to do ADR was really easy. They had done it before. Jack, the lead guy, um, that was only his second feature film. It was only his second, I think, big acting job that was okay. <laughs> on film. He had done theatre, but he hadn't really done film before. Yeah. And his ADR was just absolutely incredible. And he yeah. was one of those actors that could listen and repeat. And it was really easy, and we just had a great time. The other actors, a lot of them were first timers, okay. hadn't done ADR before. And when you get someone who hasn't done ADR, it's really difficult because they come in and they're just like, I'm going to be shit. I'm not going to be able to do this. Um, <laughs> it's a spirit. <laughs> it's, it's a common thing with actors. They think they're never going to be able to do it. They're never going to be able to repl replicate it. And it's your job as an engineer to calm them down and just make them feel comfortable. Yeah. So as soon as someone starts saying that to me, I try and make jokes and <laughs> I try and relax them instantly because that's the best way yeah. to approach it. The other thing that I try and do is actually remember their tea and coffee order, which sounds like a really stupid no. thing. <laughs> but if I notice that an actor is running low on, you know, their favourite cup of tea, I know it's soothing them. Yeah. I know it's calming yeah. them down. So with those actors, I really made sure that I did that too because okay, I just wanted yeah. them to be in the most comfortable environment that they possibly yeah. could. Um, Fight scenes is one of the hardest things to do because you have to get movement into your um, voice and movement into your vocal expressions in order to sell the ADR yeah. to make it feel realistic. But you also can't move. You can't <laughs> stamp your feet. You can't move no. your body because as soon as you do, that movement's going to be picked up in the mics. The takes are going to be unusable. Yeah. So we're back to square one. So for the fight scenes, what... I didn't do it on this one, but I do do it for other projects now. Um, a tip that the ADR supervisor for uh, Vikings gave me was he gets the actors to hold a yoga band. Okay. <laughs> so he'll get the actors to stand on the yoga band. He'll ha they'll have each side and right. they'll struggle with the yoga band. The yoga band doesn't make any noise. Yeah. They're not moving their clothes. So we're not picking up uh, cloth movement. They're not stamping their feet because their foot is trying to keep the yoga band down. But it gives them the sense of movement, it gives them the sense of uh, struggle and that gets conveyed in their voice and then it sells the ADR, it works perfectly. With this, I think we did get them to move ever so slightly but it was tougher for them because yeah. I didn't have the yoga band so they just kind of <laughs> had to imagine. So the studios, we thought everybody was really fit but actually <laughs> it's just the yeah. yoga band for the actress. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, you can it's use it. Just yeah. Dip, yeah. But it really, really works and it's such a clever way of uh, getting actors to, you know, recreate yeah. something, but technically it works out perfectly. Mm. And it's all those little things that do actually make a difference, and you, you don't think it will. Yep. But you need that movement. If you, yeah. if you, I'm kind of annoyed that I didn't do this, but if you had two recordings of one with an actor not moving and one with an actor moving, okay. and tried to play them back to back, you would hear the difference yeah. instantly. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a very, very good tip. So we, we talked a lot about your ADR work, but you are also a sound editor and a dubbing mixer. So can you tell me of any particularly fascinating projects you've worked on? Oh, God. I or just fascinating, without <laughs> particularly <laughs> <laughs> spine as well. Oh, <laughs> uh, what have I worked on that has been... I mean, I've, I seem to get a lot of uh, depressing topics <laughs> lately, which is delightful. <laughs> um, I did do one really good series um it was incredible it's really depressing so i am sorry about <laughs> this uh it was called swipe right for murder now the name was terrible but it was a documentary series about women who had gone on online dates okay and obviously had ended up 
murdered. Okay, think that is more depressing than I thought. Yeah, it would be. yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> and it's really, it's really, really horrible because it's really horrible looking at that from you know. I think I was on it for a month and I was doing uh, sound design and, um, and mix and it's really tough watching that yeah. over and over again. And factual is always tougher because you know it's true. Drama and feature, yeah. you know, if something sad happens, you can kind of turn it off and you know yeah. that's fake and it's fine and everybody's okay. And that series was probably really interesting to work on because you had some small recreations but okay. you also had like the interviews with the family and you had to be careful because we didn't want to make the recreations cheesy or yeah. over Americanized <laughs> yeah. and we wanted the whole documentary series to be really respectful towards the families yeah. because this was obviously a really grim topic. Yeah. So the way we approached it was we kept everything really minimal okay. and we just kept it really realistic and kept it simplistic. We didn't you know, push the music too much. We didn't go over stylized with graphic sequences or you know the the opening title sequence is quite heavy and you could have done loads of sound design you could have put loads of washes yeah. in it made it real you know dramatic and we decided against it yeah because we were like that's not the show this needs to be yeah it needs to be respectful of these women and that was probably an interesting project because it, it could have easily gone one of two ways and I'm glad it went the way that it did um, and the team were just lovely it was okay one of the few teams that I've worked on that has been all female. Okay. <laughs> um, producer, writer, well, not writer, but, you know, storyline yeah. person. Um, <laughs> and uh, picture editor, everybody. All right. Was, was that an intentional thing? Just it just happened. ended up being That's that way. <laughs> and it was, it was really interesting because it was before um, Hashtag Me Too happened. Okay, all right. <laughs> so they were kind of like leading the way before everything kicked off. And it was, re it was a really nice project to work on. Besides the obvious, you know. No, I know grim. what you mean. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was probably an interesting one. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, kids animation is always interesting because you're basically starting from scratch. You never have anything. Um, you're given a script and you have to record the voices. And after that, it then goes to the animators. But unlike, you know, drama, feature, documentary, anything like that, you don't get sync sound you're only getting back your recordings that you've yeah. already done for voices and you have to recreate the, or create a universe that didn't exist. Um, so one of the ones that I did was actually set in space and I've no fucking clue what space sounds like. I don't even know if space has a sound. Yeah, that's what I <laughs> <laughs> And we have to do it for um, the character travel to different planets. Okay. Um, so in each episode, I had to recreate the sound of a planet that pop like, probably didn't have a sound and I didn't have any guidance I just knew some were hot and some were cold so I had to <laughs> use that as a an idea of what I was going to do and it's really fascinating because you basically have the most creative freedom you have probably in all of sound post yeah. you don't get that in any other mm. genre I mean drama you get a bit but not that much and it's really interesting to work on I mean there's only so many kids animations I can do now because I've done enough with them but it's incredible because you, you can just do whatever comes to mind. You can just try it out. Um, animation directors are so much more flexible okay. in their approach to sound. They really just want you to experiment and go mental and just try whatever you feel is right. That's nice. Yeah, and that was probably, yeah, that was an interesting one too. It was really fun. So, so, so given, given that, that scenario where you have all this freedom, how, how do you get started? So what is the first thing that you do? So you're told you can do whatever you want with this animation and the sounds of space. So what yeah. is your, your first, what do you do first? I watch through what the animators have done. Yeah. Because no matter what the script says, the animators always add in little personal touches <laughs> that are always really interesting. So I always look out for those. I see what's going on in the background, you know, what kind of textures they've used, colours they've used. Um, and then... I don't know, something in my brain just always clicks and a sound will just come straight to mind of whatever is on screen and I'll know instantly what that sound is. I'll find it in my library, I'll put it in and okay. it doesn't always necessarily work by itself. I'll yeah. usually have to layer it up and then I'll start experimenting with different layers of different sounds. Yeah. I'll try pitch, I'll try reverb, I'll try delay um, and then usually it just it fits. I've been really lucky, I suppose, with the. I think it's kind of this, this kind of doing by by actually creating at the same time and yeah. then discarding and modifying. So, uh, 
So that's how I guess you you're saying your ideas come come, come to, life. to life. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I I suppose I get to know my directors as well. Okay. And that's always a big thing because some directors, especially with kids animation, some of them don't want to go um, over the top cartoony. Okay. <laughs> Others want to go for a more realistic approach as well. So you always have to judge your director. Yeah. Um, and after a conversation or two with them, I'll always have a better idea okay. of what they want. So, okay. yeah. Good. And, and you've, you've talked a little bit about kind of reverb delays. And I was wondering, do you have any plugins that are your, your to go plugins that you, you couldn't live without? Uh, well, Orex. Um, <laughs> I think we're going to have to yeah. buy that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not just Ambience Match, though. I mean, D Click, uh, D Clip, D Noise. I think the three of them have just been lifesavers to anybody who works on Audio Post in the yeah. last few years. They just clean up so much stuff. Yeah. And especially, like, for entertainment and factual, your timescales are really tight. Okay. Like, you will get um, a day edit, um, day pre-mix, and day final mix. And your okay. final mix day is usually when your client is in. Okay. So <laughs> it's, not, no, <laughs> it's not an awful lot of time. And that's for an hour-long documentary. Okay. Well is nice. You get three days. To show you the difference in scale, a feature film, you can have weeks. And you have a whole team of and people. students complain that their timelines are not yeah, no, long enough. No. <laughs> <laughs> ah, seems like we give them plenty of time. Yeah, you do. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, you do, totally. Because I've, yeah, I've experienced their timelines. They have loads of time. I, I like having this on record, you see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get shot. Let's complain, I say. Em- Emma said. <laughs> no, 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 no. We won't be doing that anytime soon. Um, but yeah, so those tools have just really helped because before, I mean, if you wanted to de-click someone, you had to go and physically draw it out. I know, it's a pain in the backside, <laughs> and I still do it now and again, but if you have a voiceover for an hour-long show and you've had an actor in or an actress who, even though you've told them to take sips of water or eat an apple or suck in <laughs> a hard-boiled sweet to try and make their yeah. mouth unsticky, none of it works. No, they just no, have that type of do, voice, yeah. 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 And you just do not have the time in three days to go through and de-click everything or in every single line. And Orex has just made it like so simple. So that's definitely one of my go-to plugins. I am personally a fan of Waves as well. So I love the mm. Waves EQ, okay. um, or EQ six, one of my favorite EQs, and then the Q ten for if I need to notch um, like really noisy frequencies out. Okay. Everybody else I speak to loves Fab Filter. Personally, I'm not a fan. It's sometimes controversial. Um, I know a lot of people love it. I don't. It's okay. But well, yeah. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> Good. I'm going to. We're hey, not, <laughs> we're, not, we're not selling plugging, so that's all right. <laughs> I just hope it's not on the free student bundle that they get. Don't, I don't think so. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't um, think so. If it is, I'm sorry. It's great if it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, or EQ6, and then I always use the uh, or compressor as well. Okay. Um, and then for loudness metering, I just kind of use whatever's there. I'm not okay. really too fussy. They all do the same thing. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. They all do it. Once they tell me if my mix is minus 23, I don't care. <laughs> and that's the honest answer. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> we call back to differ, but <laughs> But it seems yeah. like you have a kind of a set that are your, your go-to yeah. go to tools. And what about monitoring uh, in, in a studio? Monitoring. So do you have any particular reproduction uh, system that you use? Um, well, I mean, I always go to General X. I okay. love General X. They're, they're okay, they're sustaining members. They're fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some people say that General X are too bright. I personally find them perfect for mixing. I've mixed on quite a few. Um, Adam's... I, I don't mind. I okay. think they work perfectly as well. Um, I just love the brightness of Channel X. I just, yeah, they're my favourites. And do you do you work in a stereo format? Do you work like a one? Do you use any other formats? It depends on the project. Okay. It's generally stereo. Um, <laughs> Netflix is kind of changing the game now because they're actually, I need to read this on the train home. <laughs> um, and I don't know if they have covered this, but I do know that they're now demanding that any show delivered to them has to be done in 5.1 in stereo. Okay. So it means that every mixer who is used to doing just a stereo mix is now going to have to get used to doing 5.1 okay. and stereo. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a good thing because <coughs> audio is evolving. Like, I mean, Dolby Atmos has come in. Yeah. It's changing the game. I haven't had a play around with Dolby Atmos yet, and I can't wait to do it. <laughs> um, I've got a lovely friend called 
uh, Chris Aragon, and she owns a studio called 5A, and they've just built a um, Dolby Atmos room. And she's a huge supporter of women in sound. Yeah. So she's basically said to a few of us in London, come to the studio, have a play around, and just get used to it, because God knows when you're going to have to do it. And I just think it's incredibly supportive, and it's m- yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, so I'm taking full advantage of that. I'm yes, you should. <laughs> yeah. uh, so generally, yeah, it's stereo on 5.1 that I concentrate on. And do you work in a home studio? Do you have a home studio or do you work in, in different studios? I don't studios? call it a home studio. Okay. Because I believe a studio needs to be properly acoustically treated. Okay. Yeah. And I disagree with every freelancer who says that they have a home studio when it's a setup in their bedroom. I mean, that's what I have as well. And I mean, it's not. We all have that. Yeah, we all have. And it's not a proper studio. It's yeah. not suited to doing a proper sound mix. Yeah. Nothing is ever going to be as good as going into a proper studio that's been acoustically treated. And, you know, it's designed for that purpose for a reason. Yeah. So generally I'll do pre-mixing or editing at home. And then depending on the project, I'm either hired by a company and okay. I'll go into a company or I'll rent a studio room as well. Okay, yeah. yeah. And yeah, it just that's, that's, that's a very good point. So... Kind of the kind of the next thing I wanted to ask you about is, of course, you, you we, we talked about at the start how you kind of worked in the company for ten years. Mm. Uh, you had a very very kind of good working relationship and a very successful career. And you've recently, only kind of a few months ago, you decided to go freelance, mm. didn't you? T- t- tell us about what that process was like. Terrifying, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> terrifying, and it still is. Um, it's getting easier, but it was. So screen, I was really lucky in Ireland. I was in the most incredible company. Um, I really honestly have no bad words to say about them because they, they trained me and I wouldn't have a career if it wasn't for them. And the only reason I left was because I wanted to progress more into drama and feature film. Okay. And I was about to mix my first drama series there and that was amazing, but I would have been waiting maybe a year, two years, until I got to do my next one. Okay. And I was like, I'm not prepared to do that. I want to progress faster. So the best move is to come to the UK. When I was in Ireland, never experienced sexism from the people that I worked with. Mm. Come to the UK, (laughs) slap me in the face. And it slapped me in the face hard. And I found that working in companies in the UK, my treatment was just so bad. It made me want to leave the industry. And I was just like, this isn't actually okay. Because I've given up my whole life to come and progress my career. And instead, I'm actually considering leaving the job that I've worked my backside off for Mm. 10 odd years. So I had taken on a six month contract at a new uh, facility and it was coming to the end of that. And I kind of decided, you know what, I Mm. don't think I want to do this anymore. My own mental well-being. Of course. Um. So I decided to take the risk and go freelance. And I I tried to be smart when I moved over to the UK and I tried to make sure that people got to know me and I networked really well and got myself out there. And I mean, I hate it's networking as much as the next person, <laughs> but I forced myself to do it because I knew that I had to. So I, by the time I decided that I was going to make this move, I knew I was in an okay position. I had just been voted onto AMPS Council. Okay. I had done the Women in Film and TV mentoring scheme, so okay. that had given me a lot of connections as well. Um, I had made sure that I had met up with a lot of people as well yeah. in the industry and got to know them. So I was already starting to contact people and say, look, I think I'm going to go freelance. You okay. know, If something comes up, can you keep me in mind? So I had two months where I didn't really work. And then pretty much been fully booked since which has been really lucky and I'm glad I took it I mean it is scary and I wake up every morning and I'm like oh crap is this the day that the phone is going to stop ringing and I'm not going to get a job and I might have to go back to Ireland and I really don't want to do that because it rains too much and I want to stay in London Um, (laughs) well it also rains (laughs) it rains less over here than it does back there so you'll see this when you go over in March (laughs) um and yeah, I, I really don't regret it. And I've gotten so many other opportunities that I could never take advantage of when I was in a company. Like, I, I love mentoring. And I love the work that I get to do with the Media Trust. Yeah. Um, seeing those kids progress is just so important to me. And 
the kids with the media trust actually come from disadvantaged backgrounds. So they're what the government considers NEAT, which I never remember how the exact wording of this acronym, mm. but it means never in um, third level education or employment. Okay. So they're coming from really, you know, not great households. Yeah. Some of them come to me with quite a lot of problems and all they want to do is just progress into yeah. the creative industry. And I couldn't do that in a facility. Yeah. I was never given enough, not even flexibility, just finishing at a reasonable hour that I could go yeah. and meet my mentee. Um, okay. It was just frustrating. So that kind of fed into the decision as well. It yeah. was like, there's so much more that I could be doing with my time. I could be helping someone and I can't because, you know, you've fecked up the booking so much that I have to stay here for 14 hour days. Yeah. When I could be out like helping this young kid that actually needs it. So yeah, it's been scary. And from what every freelancer tells me, it's going to continue to be <laughs> scary. We'll just get a little bit less. Um, but I don't regret it. Really don't regret it. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and, and do you have any advice for, I mean, we have a lot of students today, for if, if someone wanted to, to start uh, setting themselves as a freelancer, uh, what would be your advice? What, what sort of things do you need to do? Network. It is like the most obvious one, but you have to. You have to get yourself out of your comfort zone. And I will tell you, it's horrible. And I'm <laughs> shitting it sitting up here. So Everybody you know. hates networking. That's <laughs> fine. Everybody pretends they like yeah. it. But <laughs> you know, no, actually, I can genuinely say I do enjoy it now because I do like being in a room with people. But when I first started, I was like, how the feck do you sell yourself to someone in like two minutes? And then business cards. Oh, my God. So I kept... I think I've gone through about six different different business card designs. And then someone told me, why did you go to Vistaprint? You should have gone to Moo or something. I don't know even what Moo is. Apparently, it's a different uh, website you can do business cards on, but it makes a difference. Okay. <laughs> um, I didn't know this, so I ordered from the wrong site. Um, sure, that made all the difference. But yeah. But, <laughs> um, network, but LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the biggest thing. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot of people say that as in that yeah, exact sorry. tone. <laughs> sorry, I, look, I looked really sceptical. I apologize. <laughs> I believe No, you. everybody says it, though. As soon as I say LinkedIn, everybody's like, really? LinkedIn helps your career so much. Get your profile. Make sure you have a picture of yourself. Make sure that your information is up to date. Make sure you have a really good... Um, you know, bio about yourself in, okay. I think there's like a summary about yourself at the top yeah, of your page. So. Um, make sure that's there. And if you can, get recommendations because you will be surprised how many people actually look at your LinkedIn page. It's the first place I go to if I want to find out about someone that's contacted me just by email. Mm -hmm. I go and check out their LinkedIn to see what they've actually done, how reliable the information is. Um, and I know employers, um, anybody who's looking to hire me, if it's for freelance or if it's for staff, whatever, I'll go to my LinkedIn page yeah. and it's the best tool that you can use. Jobs are posted on LinkedIn that might mm -hmm. not necessarily be posted anywhere else. Yeah, that's a good um, point. Yeah. Recruiters use LinkedIn as well to yeah. hire crew for jobs. I know so many other freelancers who've gotten contacted through LinkedIn about being uh, sound assistants on feature films. Okay, yeah. It gets used so much and it's so overlooked. Yeah. So that's the best piece of advice I can give is actually get your LinkedIn up, yeah. network. Twitter, I found, actually has been really useful as well for work, which mm -hmm. quite surprised me. I am I bloody hate Facebook. I don't yeah. like using it. I think it's a nasty place full of, you know, horrible <laughs> comments that can happen. But Twitter, I found that it's actually, the sound community is huge on Twitter. Yeah, it is, yeah. And they all engage so yeah. well. And it's just been incredible. So that's the other thing, Twitter, but keep it professional. Don't mix your personal Twitter and your private or your work Twitter. Don't blur those lines because I don't want to be going onto someone's Twitter account that I might be working with. Complaining about what they ate last night. Well, exactly. And seeing a photo of your lunch. No, I've no interest or seen some dodgy video of you on Saturday night. Just as, part. as hilarious as it might be, I don't need to see it. So I think that's probably the other thing is like keep it personal yeah. keep, and keep it professional one and make sure that the lines never blur. And mm. the same with like any of your social media. If you want to have a public social media page that is for your work, like if it's Instagram or Facebook, then have a, a personal one and a professional one. 
And I think so many people, when they're starting out, forget that. And it's a really simple thing yeah. that if you don't do it, it can totally feck you up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess that would be the, the best places mm. to start. I guess it's, a, it's an easy way to start networking, isn't it? Because exactly. then you'd be a bit, you know, you're more prone to be anxious in social situations. At least, you know, yeah. you don't have to do a face-to-face thing. You can meet someone online through, through one yeah. of these networks and then, you know... At least you have something to talk about <laughs> when you when you see them. I say it's like bad online dating. <laughs> it's exactly the same. Anybody who's done online dating will know and they can relate. It's like you know, after to... that documentary you talked about, <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I, think I know. I don't think that. that's what I want to think about right now. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have brought that up. Sorry. <laughs> we live that out. <laughs> yeah. Now we do have some. We've left some time for questions from. Other people. So does anybody have any questions that you want to ask? Oh, come on. <laughs> well, this is good. This means I, I can I get to the point. I have a very basic question related to ADR. So to what percentage do you think ADR is made, like nowadays? It varies. Mm-hmm. It really, really varies. So I know for um, Mission Impossible, that came out recently. Only 20 to 30% of that movie was actually ADR, which is really quite surprising considering some of the scenes that were in it. You'd expect that more of it was going to be ADR. Um, I know of other shows where whole characters have been ADR for the whole series, <laughs> which <laughs> no one has actually noticed. That's good. But w- it's really, really good. But that means that the cue count, so your ADR lines are referred for. for ugh, can't use my words now, <laughs> referred to as cues, um, the cue count for that was mental because I think it was quite a well-established character in the series and they had to ADR every single line because they didn't like the actor's uh, accent. <laughs> uh, he then got replaced for the next season, so it's fine. I was going to say, it's not like <laughs> yeah. he goes to the studio and the accent just magically no. changes. <laughs> I think it was one particular producer didn't like this particular actor his appearance, but then when they got into post-production, I know it's really very vain. Um, <laughs> when they got to post-production, they decided that they didn't like his voice. So they decided that they couldn't reshoot everything, so they were going to revoice him. So it's called an, um, a redub. Mm. So they redubbed his whole lines for the whole series. So that series, the line count was just mental. But I, I don't know in percentages what it would have been. But you need to take into account as well that um, crowd is also considered as ADR. Mm-hmm. And you'll also have stuff like um, in What Richard Did, there's a lot of scenes where you'll just see the actors by themselves and they're just breathing or you mm-hmm. know they're just walking around. We'll record breaths. Breaths are a huge part of ADR mm-hmm. and it's to give the actor a bit of presence. Um, it makes you feel like you're in the scene with them. It makes you feel like the scene is more alive and more real. Um, so that brings up the count as well. So it's it's probably quite a lot. It's probably quite high, but it does vary. And then who's who's deciding? Okay, we need ADR. Like who's evaluating there? Okay, so this person is gonna make the job easier with ADR, or like this mixer is gonna make the job easier with like all this like cleaners and plugins like magic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like who who decides that in, in the production? It's. So it will come down to the dialogue supervisor. Um, They will go through all of the dialogue takes that they have. So they won't just use the take that's been used in that scene. They'll go through all the other takes that were shot on that day of that particular scene. Um, If there's a line that they need to do for technical reasons. So ADR can be done for a few different things. It can be done for technical reasons. It can be done for performance. Or it can be done to add in additional lines. So... Okay, so there was a project that I worked on quite a few years ago, and it was about uh, Titanic. And they really, really fecked up their timeline. (laughs) And in order for them to fix their continuity, they had to add in an additional line of ADR. And they had to get an actor to do it. Now, the actor turned up pissed as a fart. Um, It was in the days of ISDN. And ISDN came before Source Connect, so it was using telephone lines. Pain in the arse. Never worked, especially in Ireland. Constantly dropped out. Um, And we needed to redo this line in order for the continuity to work. So the person who decided that was the director. 
and that was because his storyline was just not going to work unless <laughs> we got this line. Um, we, we eventually got the line after very painful, <laughs> I think, 20 takes of said line because um, he was so drunk. But we got there, so it's fine. Um, you'd be surprised how many times that It happens. saves the continuity, that's fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but it will be down to the dialogue editor. He will always try, or she will always try and salvage what is there. And they'll try and use noise reduction, declip, denoise, everything that they have, try and use an alternative take. And when they realise that they literally do not have any other options, then they'll start putting their lines on their AD or Q list. It's then at the director's discretion to say, yes, I want to do all of this, or no, I don't want to do all of this. I want to reduce the line count, because I know the actor will just say no. We always try and encourage the directors to still get them, mm. because when they get to final mix, it doesn't matter how good your mixer is. If the line is totally covered in noise, there's only so much you can do with plugins. You need to get it. You need to get it mm. as a safety because it's going to stand out. And this is when people start saying that you can hear bad ADR. <laughs> bad ADR is when, you know, usually there's been a line where the director doesn't want to do it. He's convinced the actor that they don't need to do it. They'll only do one take of it. And they'll get to the final mix. The director will decide, actually, I do want to use the ADR, but they've only got one take, and the one take was shy. <laughs> and that's when bad ADR happens, because <laughs> they haven't given us time to do our job. Yeah. Okay, that's a very good question. I hope that answers it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Do you have any other questions? How much more are you aware of like, other parts of production? So I realise you have a expertise in sound, but how yeah. much do you know about producing or editing? I, I'm a, I've tried to learn more about it as I've gone on in my career, because I do find it's really helpful. Um, I found when I was a runner, I learned a lot more, because I used to try and sit in on the different departments. So. I think in order to do your job well as a sound engineer, you need to understand what happens in an online, what happens in a grade, what happens in the picture edit, why they're doing it, why they're going to start affecting your job. Um, so I do know bits, but I don't know as much as I'd like. Um, from post-production side of things, I do have a better understanding of a post-production supervisor and what their job entails and all the booking and managing and basically playing uh, Tetris with their schedules of how they're going to fit everything in because nothing locks on time. Um, but it's definitely something that I think is really valuable to understand. Um, so I will always try and talk to the different departments that I'm working with um, to find out if anything that they're going to do is going to impact me. Because sometimes a director will say to them that they want to cut out a scene in the picture that they haven't told me and that actually impacts me because it impacts completely my sound and I have to do a reconform to their new cut which is additional time. It also means re-delivering all my stems. Mm. But the director hasn't thought about that. And if I hadn't had the conversation with the picture editor, I never would have known. No one would have known. So, yeah, it's, it's always a really important thing to do. Any other questions? Um, what has been the most like, heated uh, moment <laughs> for you in ADR? And how did you deal with it? The drunk actor. It was drunk <laughs> actor. <laughs> that did sound pretty bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was... It was with this well-known director who was known for being really fiery anyways. Um, and what basically happened was it was one of my first ever alone source connects, our uh, ISDN sessions. And ISDN lines in Ireland were just never maintained because we had a company called Aircom who look after all the telephone lines. They didn't give a crap. ISDN was rarely used by anybody else except for um, send engineers. And we were in the middle of trying to get this really tough take and the ISDN kept on dropping out right in the middle of the line. Now, I knew that the studio on the other side was recording everything, so we were still going to get it. Nothing was lost. It was all absolutely fine. This director, on the other hand, was already fired up about the fact that the actor had turned up pissed. <laughs> was already annoyed that we weren't getting this line and he really needed it for his continuity. <laughs> And then the bloody ISDN is dropping out every two seconds. So he can't even hear what this line is sounding like. And he starts screaming and shouting at me, saying, what the fuck is going on? Why is this not working? And you can't do anything in that moment. Mm -hmm. And you can't talk back. You can't start getting angry with the director. You just have to sit there, bite your tongue, and take it. And you have to let them calm down. And this is where personality comes back mm -hmm. into it. You have to be calm. 
and you cannot show that all of this is affecting you. You can cry as much as you like afterwards, which is what I did, I can tell you that much. Um, but you, you just have to remain calm, and that was, that was one of the heated ones. And in fairness to the director, at the end of it, he was like, great job, it was really nice working with you, and walked out of the studio, and then I broke down in tears. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, that, that was probably one of the most... Do you interact with the actor himself? During yeah, I always do. Um, I, you always chat to them. You always make sure that the actor is on your side from day one. Is there anything you did to like try and make him more... Uh, Relax? Re like more, so I don't know, just desober him somewhat? Oh, no, there was, there was no hope with this one. <laughs> no, he's totally gone. Right, totally. Okay. Yeah, I think he... Yeah, he, he had gone out on the piss the night before for a party and had obviously continued drinking throughout the day. Yeah, pretty much. And it happens a lot. We had another actor who came over from the States and he was getting away from his wife and kids. And he was Irish and he lived in the States now. But he had decided to go out uh, on the piss with all of his friends the night before. And um, first he didn't show up to his first session. Um, so we were all sitting around waiting to go. Didn't show up. Then he was scheduled in for the next day to do it again. And uh, he turned up drunk. And uh, all you can do is give them coffee and hope for the best. <laughs> I think, Paul, you had a question? Yeah, I, I wanted to know your thoughts on... There was a recent thing last year about uh, elderly people complaining about dialogue on TV. I just had <laughs> an elderly person <laughs> complaining to me about it today. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, so, Mumblegate. Mumblegate yeah. is a big issue. Um, there is, in my opinion, quite a few reasons why Mumblegate happens. Um, TVs, new TV designs, it's a huge thing. Mm. Speakers are most of the time placed on the back of TVs. Where are you going to put your TV? In the corner of a room. Where's your speakers? Pointing against the wall. How are you going to hear anything? So unless you have mm. a sound bar at the front, it's already going to automatically affect your sound. Um, the other thing that I think that happens is when you're on set, the, the actors, directors, you know, the location sound recordists, don't forget they've read that script. They've read it a million times. They know that dialogue inside out. But when you get to the picture edit stage or the dialogue edit stage, those people don't. This is the first time they're hearing it. They're going to hear if an actor hasn't projected enough. Whereas the people on set, if an actor is not projecting, they're not necessarily going to pick up on it because they're mm. so used to the, the dialogue and the script. So it just slips past them. And that's another big issue is where location recorders really need to start speaking up and if they are in even the slightest bit unsure that that dialogue is not intelligible they need to call it and I know some location recorders are put in a, in a really difficult position where mm. directors just don't give a shit about location sound mm. and they just don't want to listen to their location mm. recorders and it, that needs to change it rarely all that can be fixed in the mix we've got all these wonderful tools yeah uh, we haven't got time move on yeah and it's really frustrating and usually what it costs them is in ADR because now they're going to have to ADR that line because yeah. when it comes to it, it won't work. Yeah. But they won't listen. No. And that's a huge issue. And directors need to start doing it. Like, they need to start... Tr they've hired these location recorders for a reason. Mm. They're talented. They know what they're doing. Trust them and trust their opinion when they speak up. But I know so many location recorders that just don't bother now because they're like, well, what's the point? <laughs> and that then feeds into yeah no and it, is, it is it's really awful because yeah. they wouldn't do the same to their um their camera operators yeah. wouldn't do the same to their DOP they'd listen to their DOP in a second and if it meant that they had to you know reset everything up and reshoot they do it no bother sound comes in and says it nah we don't matter and it's it's frustrating and, and the, the yeah. other issue is is multi camera yeah. so you can't you, everything's on radio mics and of course they've got to be buried because you can't see the radio mics in drama. Mm. So you've got you've got all of that problem because they're trying to do a wide and a short and a tight shot at the same time. Mm. So you can't have a boom in. Yeah. So your good quality mic pickup gone. And you've got to rely on radios that are covered in material and just yeah. rustle like hell. And then again, but, maybe but why now then they're like why why do you think it sort of came up last year and not Well, it's not just come up last year. I mean that happened in Ripper Street so series yeah. two that we worked on in Dublin. That was the first major one that happened. And I think, if you look back at it, I could be wrong about this, but that's when TV sets started changing mm. and started mm. becoming these new flat screens that just had shitty speakers on them. But there's also a move in drama for more realism. Mm. 
yeah. which means the lines are delivered realistically. And also actors are less and less being taught what I, old school would call a stage whisper. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They are expect they they are they want they the director asks them to deliver the line for real. You're often recording in noisy environments, so you, you're sunk before it's even got in the microphone. Yeah. Like one of my biggest notes in ADR uh, to an actor is you need to project more. And I'm sick and tired of saying it. <laughs> it's getting on my nerves. Buy a t-shirt. I, I'm, well, if I wore t-shirts, I would. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Address. Um, yeah. <laughs> Projection. Um, but no, it happens constantly. Like, And I'll get to a point where I refuse to turn up my gain anymore to get mm-hmm. a decent level. Because mm-hmm. I'm like, you're not projecting enough. I can tell you're not projecting enough. And if you don't, we're going to be in the same situation we were in five minutes ago, where... This is just going to be mumbled, and it's no point. And, and how do you how do you deal that with? Because well, you might have someone that's a major actor. How do you deal with that with telling someone that is quite tell big? Them. Do you just tell them? And yeah, it's okay. You have to treat yeah. everybody in the studio okay. the same way. And I don't care if you're Robbie Downey Jr. or whoever. <laughs> I am going to treat you to the okay. same as any actor. Good. And I will tell you if you're not projecting, you need to project more because I don't want takes leaving that studio that I'm not happy yeah. with. Because at the end of the day, it's my reputation. And as you say, I mean, if it's, it, it's just going to take longer, isn't it? <laughs> well, exactly. Everybody's going to be there for a longer time. <laughs> yeah. So I, I always speak up. I mean, you have to, you have to re- again, read the room and see if you're actually going to be listened to. Because, okay. again, it comes back to sometimes you're poo-pooed and you're told, you know, okay. you don't matter. Um, but nine times out of ten, I will just generally speak up and just yeah. say, look, this isn't going to work. We need to get more projection, otherwise this is not going to fit when we get to the mix. And, and just to know, there, there's a lot of work at the University of Salford on intelligibility and object-based broadcasting by, by Lauren Ward and, and, and many others, and, and Philippa uh, over here. So uh, it's worth having a chat at the wine reception. Just don't get that drunk as that actor. <laughs> 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 and we have time for one final question. Sorry, just following on, because um, there was a BBC study in 2010 that was trying to find out what the issues were. And as Farhana said, Lauren Ward, who also worked for me at Salford, also had done a study as well, mm. and about um, like mumbling being one of the reasons. But um, for, for example, with background music as well, which I know you touched briefly on, how much contact do you have with composers for music and like what tips you give them so that then they give you... They don't listen. <laughs> they do not listen. <laughs> and the worst thing that happens to a sound mixer is when a producer or director comes to us and says, the composer is going to be in the final mix. <laughs> and every time that happens to me, I say, please no. Because what a composer does is a composer comes in and tells you to push the music. And it's... I, gar- <laughs> yeah. and I, I get it. They want their work to be heard. But it leads back to intelligibility and <laughs> you can't hear what's going on. So the music needs to be pulled back. It's pulled back for a reason. You balance it for a reason. And composers just don't get that. And <laughs> you will get some composers that create these big, you know, huge scores when it's this really delicate scene where you need to concentrate in the dialogue. And, you know, there's just no telling them sometimes. Other composers are amazing. They will totally get a scene, totally get what needs to be done and just compose the most beautiful piece of music that still gets the emotion of the scene but just won't interfere with the dialogue and yeah, you can tell the more experienced composers to the the ones that haven't they just want to be heard yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> that are failed rock musicians basically <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was another question then. Um, I was just wondering from a sound design and mixing perspective is the sort of order that you tend to do things in which helps you kind of get a project moving faster or um, that helps when it comes to mixing it well so generally the projects that i do i will sound design and mix whereas a lot of people will just do sound design or mix um so i tend to mix as i'm going along i do my pre-mix so mm-hmm. as i'm setting in my sound design elements i will not sound design track lay or sound edit sound design is when more when you're manipulating sound so I don't consider myself a sound designer because I don't it's not my field I do sound editing um, but I will try and balance out my audio as I go so I will always have my dialogue playing um, while I'm laying in my sound effects so I know if the balance is going to work and if frequencies in my sound uh, sound effects are going to interfere with the dialogue I'll always monitor what's going on 
the only thing that I don't really play with the dialogue is atmospheres. I'll always do my atmospheres first. Um, mm. That's what I start with. Once I get my atmosphere bed laid, then I'll go and go to my dialogue and make sure my dialogue is nice and tidy. Because once your atmospheres are there, it helps fill in the gaps. Like, especially mm. with entertainment and factual, and you have to be fast, and I've told you, you have three days, you've got to be quick, and you've got to get everything done. So I'll do my atmospheres first, and then when I go to my dialogue tracks, and I notice that there's gaps, or there's franken sentences, as we call them, which is... <laughs> It can be a sentence made up of three different takes from three different locations for the one person to make a sentence that the production <laughs> thinks makes sense. And they're a pain in the arse and they're really difficult to get to work. But if you have a good atmosphere track underneath that, it helps sell it a little bit better. Um, so that's why I always start with them and then I'll do my dialogue pass. And then I know that they're working and then I'll start my sound edit. And yeah, that's kind of how I work. And then balance as I'm going along as well. Very quick last question. Sorry, when you go to the UK experience sort of sex and for the first time, what's wrong with the mindset or the culture in the UK that wasn't as prevalent in Ireland? Oh, that's not going to be a quick question. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a quick question? <laughs> I mean, I can't really say. I mean, the screen scene was really balanced in terms of their staff. Um, the reason I was hired for the sound department, which some people have an issue with this, I actually don't. My MD said to me, I'm hiring you because you're a woman. And I know that clients are going to feel more relaxed around you than they will do a man. And he was right, because a huge part of my client base was women, women directors, women producers. Mm. They, they did feel automatically more relaxed around me. Kids animation, the parents felt more, con more comfortable leaving their kids in a room alone with me for four hours than they would have with mm. a bloke. So screen team were really conscious about the fact that having women did make a difference. Over here, I see less concern about client services from post houses. Dublin and Ireland, it was all about making the clients happy, making them mm -hmm. feel comfortable, um, having the best staff in place because they knew that staff was the key to their business succeeding. Over here, less so. It's more about budgets and how much you can undercut <laughs> and how much, it's exactly it. It's really yeah. sad to think, but the staff is less of a concern to companies. Mm -hmm. It's more, how can I undercut that company to get all that business in here? And I think that's a huge part of the problem. It's not necessarily that it's a conscious bias against women. It's more an un unconscious bias that they don't even realise mm -hmm. that they're doing this, but they are. And it's it's really frustrating. And it wasn't just sexism, it was like there's bullying as well, and the bullying comes from both sides. It comes from men and women. Women are no angels. Like, we need to have a bit of a talk with ourselves sometimes. Like, mm. some women, they get to a position of power within this industry, and they think, well, I've had to fight, and you know, it's been a really hard struggle for me to get here, so why should I make it easy for you guys that are coming up the ladder? And instead of helping us get up that ladder, they kick it out and they don't let us mm. climb. And that's another huge issue that I found over here is just women taking other women down and it's not on, mm. it's not okay. And we should all actually be helping each other. So yeah, that's, that's what I've experienced. Okay, that was a bit of a downer of a last question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a happy question? <laughs> is, it, is it a happy question? Yeah. Thank you, please, please. Um, so out of ADR, Um, I don't enjoy editing. I can tell you that now. I fucking hate it. I really don't like it. I don't like being stuck in a room by myself. It's not for me. I like being with people. Um, so I, I flip-flop. I mean, I've said for years, this is the first time in my career that I don't know what I want to do. I came over here because I wanted to mix, and I wanted to mix feature films, and I wanted to mix high-end drama. And I've been doing so much ADR that I'm now kind of torn between whether... I do actually want to pursue mixing for drama and feature, or, or I actually just want to stay as an ADR recordist. I love both. I really do love both. And I think if I had to choose, I'd be in a really tough position. And I don't have to choose at the moment, so I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm not. <laughs> but I, lo I do love both. But both have the same kind of thing where it's people interaction, and that's what I love. I love the collaborative experience of being in a room with someone and saying, 
oh, well, this might work, and let's try this, and, oh, no, that was shite, what were we thinking? Do one, do, <laughs> about 20 million times, so we can go back to the version that we really liked. And I love that. I love playing off people in the room. It just works so well. And, actually, that's one piece of advice I'll give to any person who's starting out an audio. It is not your project. When you start working with a client, it is their baby. They have worked really hard on whatever they've given you to do, sound design, edit, mix, whatever. And you need to respect their opinion. And if mm. they say to you, no, I don't like what you've done here, I want to do it mm. this way, and you disagree with what they say, doesn't matter. Keep your mouth shut. It's their project, and you have to respect that. And I see so many engineers that fail because they don't understand that. Mm. And they just say, no, I'm not doing it that way. Or they'll be really <laughs> rude to the client. And it's like, that's the worst thing you can do. It's just respect your client. You have to. Well, that is a beautiful piece of advice. And thank you so much for coming. It's been just so enlightening and uh, to have you here. And so much. Thank you so much for coming here uh, from London to be with us. Mm -hmm. um, we filmed the talk as well, so hopefully at some point it will be available. But just do please join me in thanking Emma for a wonderful interview.